Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever, stories of loss to keep you winning. In our community, we know that to win in investing, you must take risk, but to win big, you've got to reduce it. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. To join me, go to myworstinvestmentever.com and sign up for my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter, where I share how to reduce risk and create, grow, and protect your well, fellow risk takers, this is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy. And I'm here with featured guest, Jesse Felder. Jesse, are you ready to join the mission? Absolutely. Let's do it, Andrew. Yeah, I'm excited to have you on. And uh, let, let me just introduce you to the audience. After starting his career at Bear Stearns and then co-founding a multi-billion dollar hedge fund, Jesse left Wall Street to focus his energies on research and writing. Today, he publishes The Felder Report and hosts the Super Investors Podcast. Jesse, take a minute and tell us about the unique value that you are bringing to this wonderful world. Well, I've been on a mission, I think, for my whole career to try and find new ways to reduce risk. I, I, you know, I, I love the idea of your podcast. Mm -hmm. I think this is a mission that I think all su su successful investors have been on throughout their career. How do I find ways to reduce risk? And and so whether it's through, uh, you know, I mean, I first came to markets through value investing and the idea of a margin of safety. Um, really appealed to me. I think that's one of the most important fundamental ways to try and reduce risk. Um, but over time, I've added things like uh, technical analysis and risk management in terms of just price, uh, mm. I think is very valuable. Looking at things like momentum in markets. Uh, and you know, one of the things that we did back in the hedge fund is paying a very close, uh, very close attention to insiders what are what are the corporate managers doing with their own money are they buying shares are they selling shares and then how to look at that as a way to validate your thesis so for me i try and put together a lot of these different things to uh reduce risk and find you know and, and essentially just raise my batting average we're all going to make mistakes it's going to happen no matter how good you are at what you do uh but being able to limit the number of mistakes you make and how painful they are i think is is absolutely critical you know, I before we turn on the recorder, we were talking kind of about our developments and your development and kind of careers and how things went. And sometimes when I think about risk, after I after that discussion, I was kind of thinking like outside of the world of finance, you know, what is risk? And for me, I think a risk in life that I always felt was that the risk that I would not be happy with what I'm doing. Like what is the, the negative outcome uh, in life. And I've kind of gone through a lot of changes and a lot of searching for where, where I fit. And in the end, I believe that that is actually somewhat of a risk reduction, you know, process, but I'm curious, maybe you could just talk about, you know, your own progression from where you started to where you are now, because I think it's, it's an interesting journey. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things that's, uh, you know, you learn through, you know, 30 years of this business or close to it, is that uh, you, know, you have to enjoy the day in day out process. I first uh, went to work at Bear Stearns for with a group of guys who were some of the most successful brokers in, in, in Bear. Uh, you know, they had an incredible book of business. But essentially, I, I quickly realized they were really good salespeople and I mean, had no clue how to trade or make money in the markets. Uh, and I, you know, I, I quickly realized this, you know, selling is not something I'm naturally good at. It's not something I'm interested in, in really learning how to be good at. Uh, and, you know, I, I think we end up a lot of times. Um, you know, just kind of banging our head against the wall, working at something, thinking, well, if I work at this long enough, hard enough, I'll eventually get to a place where I enjoy, you know, where I'm at. Uh, and, and I think that's backwards. You know, you really need to find something that you enjoy doing. And, you know, because if you don't enjoy it, you're just not going to be, you're not, you're really not going to get as good at it as you could in something you enjoy. So I think for me, that was my process was going, finding an area in uh, you know the markets and finance, where I could spend my time doing things that I enjoy most, and that turns out that that's you know research and writing, and so that's kind of where I'm at. 
Yeah, I mean, I the reason why I wanted to talk about that is I think, you know, there's a lot of young listeners who are trying to explore where they belong, you know, in this world. And it's a lot of people kind of idolize, oh, I want to be an investment banker. I want to be a big fund manager or whatever. And I think what lesson I've learned is no, no, what you really want to do is be happy. Right. You know, like that's yeah. the secret, because if you're strutting into work every day, happy and enjoying what you're doing, you have so there's just so much more good that comes out of it. And I think that also the other thing that I've learned is that it's we can't always know exactly what it is that we uh, want to do or be, particularly when we're young, but we can know what we don't want or don't like. And I think that not enough people walk away like you did and say, okay, <laughs> I'm out of my yeah. depth or it's not my interest. I just don't want to. And then, and then switch and say, okay, I'm going to go into to something else. And that to me, I think is part of how you reduce risk of being unhappy in your life. Yeah. Well, I think it, you know, there's, there's an important mindset you can apply to both the markets and to your career, which is, uh, you know, uh, and I can't remember, this is maybe from Market Wizards or, um, you know, the Jesse Livermore book. I can't remember which one, but you know, he talks about um, looking at losses in the market as tuition paid in the school of trading. Right? <laughs> and I think that's a really important way to look at it. Like when you make mistakes in the market, you have that opportunity to learn something. Making money in the market's great. You know, you don't really have a, a terrific opportunity to learn from that when things work out the way you wanted them to. <laughs> but they don't always work out that way. And I think if you have the mindset of of uh, looking at things as tuition in the school of trading or tuition in the school of life, like I went and tried this career, didn't work out. You know, I, what can I learn from this? Well, I can, the simplest thing I can learn is I don't want to be a broker, right? Mm -hmm. Or, uh, you know, I left the hedge fund after several years because I there was disagreements with my partner over, um, you know, ethical issues. And I thought, I don't, I don't really want to be pushing the uh, ethical envelope, you know, and, and uh, kind of tiptoeing around the line of what's legal and not legal. And that makes me deeply uncomfortable. And so I, you know, if that's what it takes to be a you know a, a top performing hedge fund, I, I don't I'm not interested. So I I think it's yeah I, I think it's a great point that you make that you know it uh, you, people think of you know well I failed because I didn't you know achieve what I set out to in this one field or not. But but uh, you know my, I think my dad was really good at teaching me you know go try different things mm. and uh, you know learning that you didn't like something is can be very valuable and mm. and help you on that path towards finding something you do enjoy. So maybe maybe just you could go through your uh, a short kind of progression of how you then transformed into your writing and you know what you're doing now and what you're providing for for clients. Yeah. So you know I I could give a little more detail on on the hedge fund. We had a long short hedge fund was our primary kind of flagship fund and it was based on um, a value discipline. Uh, we wanted to buy cheap stocks and and you know short things that we thought were overvalued, and uh, like said, insider activity was a big uh, piece of that. Uh, we wanted to find cheap stocks where insiders were buying, um, you know, net buyers in significant size. Um, you know, it's just nice when you see uh, ma company management, you know, putting their money where their mouths are. You're not just saying mm -hmm. things are great, but I'm you know I'm putting a significant amount of my net worth into a stock. Uh, to kind of back that up, and conversely, you know, you can you can see that with insider selling is a little bit harder to parse. But we saw, you know, Bernie Evers go and sell 100% of his shares of WorldCom, and you know, it, you know, the fraud allegations stuff come within a month or two later. It's it, you can see things like that when you have a founder uh, who's massively invested and decides to liquidate, you know, mm. in a very short period of time, it can be a red flag, especially when you pair it with you know, uh, cash flow, uh, red flags in the cash flow statement. It's kind mm -hmm. of like a really good sign that this is a stock to stay away from or potentially look at as a short sale opportunity. We got to the point, uh, though, in March of 2000 and, and through 1999, my partner and I started having 
some, uh, you know, getting into shouting matches over um, some of the ideas we were putting into the fund. Um, you know, he started wanting to buy some of the tech stocks that in, in the day were just flying, right? Mm -hmm. And it was really hard to, as a value investor, resist those urges. But when you came back and said, well, our mandate is not momentum trading. It's not, you know, high flying growth stocks. Our mandate is value. This is why people bought this fund was we, you know, we told them this is our process. And so, you know, we'd be getting into shouting measures. We can't, we can't put that stock in the fund. And, mm. uh, you know, he obviously was senior partner to me, so he would do it anyways. And then I had all these great value ideas, which I, I don't know if you remember in, the, in that 2000 time frame, all these old economy stocks were left for dead. I mean, you had terrific businesses that were boring, but trading five, six, seven, eight times earnings. So why are we not buying these? They have terrific insider buying. They meet all our criteria. I know they're boring as hell, but they're like, great opportunities. The and this is what we're supposed to be. Yeah, this is what we're supposed to be doing. And, um, you know, eventually I just, I decided, you know, I, it was literally March of 2000, the month NASDAQ peaked and blew off and, and rolled over. <laughs> and I didn't, I didn't have any intent in timing it that way, but I, you know, I guess my emotions had boiled over, you know, this kind of the same time as the market. And so that's when I quit the fund and um, essentially just decided to manage my own money and uh, some friends and family money. Uh, and then I started writing about markets in 2005 after just kind of, you know, having a, a front row seat to the real estate bubble in Little Bend, Oregon, where I, I moved to in 2000 uh, and watching, you know, it, be, it become the number one or two most overvalued real estate market in the United States mm. and the speculation and all that stuff. I just, you know, so I, I had to start writing about things and, and eventually turned the writing into uh, you know, the website, which is the Felder report .com, um, uh, in 2015, that, that became my full-time gig. And so that's and if, how somebody we got, go, we got. If, if somebody goes there now, what do they get, you know, and just maybe so that we can understand kind of how you progressed and what you provide compared to, let's say back then. Yeah. I, you know, it's a, um, I put up a, uh, there's a blog, a free blog on the site. I try and put up a blog post once a week. And just indicators I'm watching, trends, um, you know, that I'm that I'm reading about, uh, or or kind of, um, you know, just finding things, you know, that are that are of interest to me. Usually, they're excerpts from some of the the premium reports, but I also have a premium product that does a weekly market comment, plus, um, you know, model a, a couple of model ETF portfolios. Um, and that's all just based on on the research that I do and how the way I, I kind of look at markets from that perspective, right. of, you know, uh, uh, with a, with a, va a, a value foundation. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, I also, you know, I have I've been uh, on hiatus recently, but I started the podcast a few years ago. Super investors, kind of a nod to Warren Buffett uh, and, and Charlie Munger, who have been a you know a, an important source of inspiration and, and education for me for a long time. And um, I've been fortunate to just be able to pick the brains of some of the people in this business that I admire most. So, and what's your plan for the future for super investors? You know, I'm going to get back to it, I think, this summer. Um, it's just, you know, I, I miss uh, getting around, getting out and talking to people. A couple of years ago, right after the pandemic, I actually hit the road in my Airstream and went and interviewed people in person. So I went up to Whitefish, Montana, interviewed Jim Stack in person. It's just fantastic. I went out to um I can just picture uh, you arriving in this, yeah. you know, vehicle yes. in this Airstream. Like. Yeah. Yeah, you know, in, in Breckenridge, Colorado, um, you know, Julian Brigden came out and and we used the Airstream as a recording studio and and just to do it, you know, one on one like that is 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 fantastic. And so yeah, I, I want to get back out and and uh and and just talk to people because I find there's so many brilliant people out there that are willing to and and uh you know enthusiastic about talking, you know, talking about their process and what they're seeing in the world. Um it's funny because I you know, I've thought about doing more interviews of people in Thailand, just because that's where I am. And I've thought about, you know, having them come to my home studio and, you know, have lunch and talk. But I never thought about making making a van and going out. And yeah. you know, so. <laughs> well, that was that was kind of a product of some cabin fever right through the pandemic, the lockdowns. I'm like, I got to get out of here. Why don't I just go to them? <laughs> you know? um, be a great excuse to hit the road. Yeah, in my case, it would probably be a van, and then I would be like uh, yeah. that guy living in a van down by the river. 
But I love, oh, uh, I know during the, the, during the COVID time, part of what kind of really helped me was my podcast because it kept me communicating and, and that type of stuff. So I feel I, you know, I think that's, that's great stuff. Well, um, it's, uh, it's fascinating. I'm looking forward to, you know, the, the new episodes that are coming out on super investors and I'll have the links to, to the, the Felder report, to your website, to super investors in the show notes. So for everybody out there, check it out. Um, but now it's time to share your worst investment ever. And since no one goes into their worst investment thinking it will be, tell us a bit about the circumstances leading up to it. Then tell us your story. <laughs> okay. This was about, uh, gosh, uh, 10, 10 years ago. First of all, I have to say, I love this idea uh, of talking about your, your worst investment. I think, you know, in this day and age, especially, right, we have uh, social media, we have Instagram, you know, hashtag best life, and people just want to highlight all the good things and kind of really give a false impression of, of what their lives look like. That's better than the reality of it. I think, you know, Finn Twit, I'm a huge fan of Twitter and, you know, uh, but even there, it's like everybody's an amazing trader. They never have any losses. And, and so I think I love this idea of let's talk about this because I think I mentioned to you beforehand, you know, you listen to people like, you know, Stan Druckenmiller and he says that, you know, when he gets together with other hedge fund managers on his stature, which is, you know, there's probably a handful of them in the world. They don't talk about, you know, what they what they, their, their success is. They want to talk about their mistakes and what they learn from them. Mm -hmm. So thank you, Andrew, for this opportunity. I think this is this is a great idea. Um, anyhow, about 10 years ago, um, I came across uh, an idea that seemed to tick all the boxes for a cheap stock. I had some insider buying um, and uh, it looked really compelling. It was, I think, kind of towards the into the fall of that year, uh, I think it was maybe 2014, um, if I remember correctly, it might've been a year or two before that. But uh, this was a, a company called Corinthian Colleges, for-profit college in the US. And um, they the, the stocks had started getting uh, hurt due to potentially regulatory uh, you know, risks that were coming up. The Obama administration you know, just generally didn't like for-profit college, didn't think it was a uh, you know, thought it was it was uh, taking advantage of of students by uh, and, you know having them take on a bunch of debt and get essentially a degree that maybe wasn't as worth as much as it as it was. Corinthian had a lot of um, you know they had nursing, a lot of healthcare jobs, um, uh, you know things that you know, you know like trades, uh, and and so you know I, I thought it was a, a a decent business. I had really good profit margins. Um, and the stock was trading like three times cash flow and a bunch of, you know, had a bunch of insider buying. So I thought, you know, also we're getting towards the end of the year. You usually get that kind of small cap effect at the beginning of the year. Like people have been selling the stock to take tax losses towards the end of the year. And that selling could potentially abate after the new year. And, uh, and so I thought, you know, I'm going to take a position in this thing. And it looked from a technical standpoint that is turning around and, and pretty positive. I knew that this was a cigar butt type of uh, type of uh, situation, and so you know Warren Buffett has talked about cigar butts, where you know you can go buy a cigar right and and pay full price and have a nice long smoke for an hour, or you can find a cigar butt on you know the sidewalk and it's free. You maybe get a couple of puffs out of it, and so you get something for nothing. Got them for free. And so you you can find stocks like this. Yeah, you can find stocks like this where you know it, it's. Uh, you know, very cheap stock, and you know you're, you're you're probably not taking a lot of risk, but it's also not a wonderful company, right? I mean, a cigar butt on the side of the street is not not a beautiful thing. Um, so I, you know, I took a position in it, and I took a pretty sizable position. I, you know, I I I uh, only like to own a handful of stocks at a time. Uh, it's kind of the you know um, uh, you know. Uh, Put all your eggs in, in you know, uh, one basket and watch that basket closely is kind of the mm. philosophy I, I like to, uh, to uh, utilize. So I took a big position. The stock did actually, you know, really nothing for the next couple of months. It took off actually in January, February, small cap effect. The stock doubled uh, in a very short period of time. Uh, in fact, it might have gone 150, 200 percent. Um, and one of my friends who was, I was managing money for at the time 
called me up and said, I, I, I've never, this has never happened to me before. I've never owned a stock that's, you know, that's done this, you know, in such a short period of time. He goes, do me a favor, hold it for at least a year. I don't want short-term capital gains. I want long-term capital gains. And so this stock, which I knew was a cigar butt, and I knew I should take profits, uh, you know, I, I started to rationalize in my head, you know, well, you know, this is working out. Why don't we just hang on to it and we'll see. Maybe maybe this is a, this is a turnaround uh, and the, the, the company's going to do fine. So I held, I held on to it. I, you know, I didn't, I didn't, I, I, I might have sold a little bit, um, but I held on to it and I kept monitoring it. And as time went on over the course of the year, it, it became clearer that the Obama administration was going to uh, limit for-profit college's ability to offer student loans that could be, uh, you know, subsidized by the government, and that was essentially a death knell for these companies. If they, if their students could not get, uh, you know, debt financing to pay tuition, they were they were going out of business because that was ninety percent of their business were were people that borrowing money to pay tuition. You know, I, I naively thought uh, that there's no way that uh, the government's going to put out an, an entire segment of the, you know, an entire industry out of business. That would be like China cracking down on an industry. Right. Yeah. But there's no way, right? All right. You can't, you can't, you know, pick winners and losers. That's not a really a kind of a capitalist mindset, but neither is, you know, subsidizing student loans. Um, and so I, you know, held on to the stock gave back all of the gains and then some ended up, you know, being a, you know, going down about 50% below my purchase price being a pretty painful because it was a large position, uh, especially painful because you, when you go from having, you know, terrific gains in the stock to giving them all back and then some, uh, you know, it, it, it became a very painful thing. I did, you know, to my credit, sell it before it essentially went out of business. Uh, you know, I, I you know, I'm not going to write a stock to zero, but that said, it was one of the worst losses that that I've taken uh, as an investor in my career. And how were you justifying it as it was falling and even as it fell through your original purchase price, what was going on in your head? Because I mean, obviously, either either it was falling because of the market assuming that the Obama administration is going to do this or the Obama administration is giving signals and, you know, and, and I'm just curious, like, how did you justify continuing to hold it during that time? Well, you know, it's, it, I think you rationalize, <laughs> you know, it's, it's uh you know, one of the classic mistakes is, is your, you know, a thesis migrates, right? The original <laughs> thesis was this. Wait a minute. A, I never heard this that. Is a, thesis migration. Right? <laughs> yeah. The thesis migrates from this is a cigar butt and we might get a couple of good puffs out of it into this is a turnaround play. And there's no way they're going to put this company out of business and or this this sector, I mean, out, out of business um, because, you know, there aren't any more, you know, for profit colleges that trade on the exchange anymore. They all essentially had to shut down um, because when 90 percent of your business is, is subsidized by the government, the government says we're not doing that anymore. <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. You don't have a business anymore. And yeah, so I, I, you know, I, I think, you know, that was one of the things I learned from that, which is when the government um, decides that, uh, you know, we don't think that this should be a viable business uh, and you, you need to sit up and pay attention to that. And that's a risk. You know, when the government decides to put you out of business, that's a, that's a major risk that uh, <laughs> you, you should be, be paying very close attention to. Um and, and also, the, you know, by the, by the way, just so I understand, because I want to think about it in terms of today, when you're hearing mumblings or rumblings from a government about a particular sector or about, you know, something that they don't like, how, how what was it, you know, what, what should we be looking for? Um, you know, I, I, I Honestly, I, th I the reason I didn't think uh, that they would they would uh, you know, put them out of business is because when you look at so many other industries that are similar, I mean, even if they do uh, act as you know uh, a predator to you know their customer base, um, the government very rarely does anything about them because of regulatory capture and um, you know uh, lobbyists and all these things, right? I mean, usually these mm. these industries are so successful that they can hire lobbyists and you know and and, and have an effect in government which is the, the sad truth of the, of the situation um but i do think once sentiment 
turns, there's a tipping point, right? Um, I, I really loved uh, Malcolm Gladwell's uh, mm. you know, book on, on the topic, but there's a tipping point yeah. where sentiment, you know, is is building, um, you know, negative sentiment towards something. And all of a sudden, it's, you know, it's like something going viral. It reaches a point where the negative sentiment outweighs, you know, the government or whatever politicians willingness to listen and take those lobbying dollars. Right. Uh, you know, and, and so I, I think uh it's important to watch that, you know, there are people that do really good. Um, I think, you know, Ben Hunt, uh, Epsilon Theory uh, is, you know, does some really interesting analysis on narrative dynamics and how do these narratives play out in the markets. And that's something that I pay very close attention to also mm. is how, uh, you know, our, our, how much pushback do we have here? One that I've been watching closely for several years now and hasn't quite yet had the effect that I, uh, that I would have imagined is, kind of the negative pushback on big tech uh, for, you know, especially social media. Um, you know, it, it's been, I think, evident for a long time now that uh, Facebook, especially Meta, has tuned its uh, you know, algorithms such that they create engagement, right? And that mm -hmm. engagement is vastly um, skewed towards negative negativity towards getting people to be angry, getting people to be upset, getting people to feel depressed. Um, and so that they act out of that negativity. And that's what where the engagement comes from. Um, when you see things like teenage suicide rates have exploded as a result of, uh, you know, as, as partly as a result of this, you would think that the pushback, uh, you know, would create um, greater regulation things. Mm. Um, and maybe it's just kind of a, a creative destruction uh, force, you know, with more people gravitating to TikTok, instead, you know, and away from Instagram and things because of that. And so maybe there are market forces at work there too. Um, but, but I, you know, when I watch the narrative surrounding those types of things, that's something I, I watch very carefully. And I think it's something that, uh, you know, it's probably the biggest thing I, I took away from this. It's uh, mm. one major mistake that I so had. So let's, uh, if you could, maybe you could just summarize the main lessons that you learned from this. For sure. Uh, the first is um, thesis creep. Don't let you know, the thesis migrate. You need to remember, why did I buy something? And, and then come back to, is it working out the way that I anticipated or is it not? And, you know, uh, in, um, you know, Jesse Livermore, uh, you know, I, I, I'm going to bungle the quote. I'm going to paraphrase it. Um, famously said, when you found that you've made a mistake, there's only one thing to do, and that's get out of the trade, right? Don't don't rationalize it. Don't whatever. say, I made a mistake, get out, right? That's mm -hmm. And I think that's that's a critical thing because you can always, when you own something, your natural um, you know, biases and things are going to be to rationalize why I should continue to own it, why things are going to be better than maybe the markets are, are working out. And when you actually sell something, that's, you know, then you can actually, you know, quiet those biases and say, okay, what's the real situation here? And maybe, you know, maybe I should buy it again. And I think from a trading standpoint, that's critical. Mm. Um, and then I think the other thing is, is uh, you know, never underestimate the government's uh, willingness to, you uh, Put, put an entire industry out of business if it serves, uh, you know, uh, a political or economic purpose. Um, mm. And in this case, I think it served both. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll I'll say some things that I took away from the story. Um, there's, it's interesting because on the one hand, you would say that kind of private education, private colleges, uh, there should be a real good market in there in the U.S. for that. I think uh, that's the first thing. So I can see some of the attractiveness, but the problem I would say, so there's a couple of different things that I was thinking about as you were going through it. The first sure. is you're selling to people who have no money, students, young right. people. And that's already a difficulty in any business model. Right. <laughs> and yes. then the, the second thing is I, I my saying uh, nowadays is government ruins everything. And basically the government Originally, when 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 I was young, uh, we could get a loan from a bank that was somehow government guaranteed uh, or supported, let's say, and uh, but it wasn't you know a huge amount of money, and we'd get that, and I I spent that. I got my student loans, and I spent that on my college, but it didn't bankrupt me. You know, I mean, it was 
it, it allowed me to get through school. Uh, so there's there's a good side of that. But when the government then eventually took over student loan and basically kind of took it in as a government program and put that on the government's balance sheet, now you have a huge problem because now they just dole out cash. And when you flood any industry with cash, that, yeah. you know, it, it naturally is going to bring out people that are going to try to get that cash. So you're going to have some crooks in there. And then it also brings a huge volume of new participants in the market who wouldn't have been able to necessarily access that product or service, which you know ma massively increases demand, which then drives up price. And the same yeah. thing they do in mortgage loans where they think everybody needs to have a mortgage loan. They have, that's a right. And so they push out mortgage loans from the 80s and the 90s and all of that and mandate Fannie, Fannie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac to take on low income mortgage loans, knowing that they're, there's a lot of risk there and that they're expanding the market massively. And then it pushes up price. So the first lesson I want to highlight is, you know, just be very careful about when you're in a situation that's being, the pump is being primed by the government and particularly in an industry where the potential uh, uh, customers are poor, they don't have any money. And so those are kind of the bigger themes that I was thinking about. The other thing that uh, I looked, I, I remember well, what you said was, I don't want short-term gains. You know, you were mentioning about that discussion about I want long-term gains. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, that I'm ultimately, you don't want to be driven, particularly that can be driven by tax because of yeah. the tax. So all of a sudden you're making- a, That should not be a, yeah, yeah. a driving so you, factor. Yeah. yeah, tax is not a good motivator. Occasionally there are times, but generally tax is not a good motivator for you know building that uh, position. And then uh, finally, I would just say that uh, the idea about kind of getting out, I think one of the things that I, I always say is that if I, was a, if I was running a fund management company and I had fund managers- Every three months, I would bring him into the conference room and I'd say, oh, I've got good news and bad news. And then they'd say, what is it? And I'd say, oh, yesterday I sold all of your positions and now everybody's portfolio is cash. Right. You can do anything you want. You know, like the idea, the right. practice of going back. And that's what we do in our strategies is we, every quarter, we reevaluate everything and we imagine that we're in cash. And so that helps us to deal with the th thesis creep and not trying to be in, you know, not, not staying in something that we probably shouldn't be in. So those yeah. are some of the things I'd take away. Um, anything else you'd add to that? No, I, I just, I love that, that framework of would I, if I didn't own it today, would I be buying today? Because that's a great question to ask yourself. Um, I, I think a lot of times um, you, know, you get stuck in a stock, you yeah. know, people get stuck in a stock and they go, well, you know, if I just get back to even, um, you know, I'll sell it. And, mm. you know, I, that is probably one of the most dangerous mindsets that I've, I've come across is the idea of when I get back to even, you don't have to make it back the same way you lusted. I think that's another Jesse Lermore, you know, uh, trope is that, you know, you, there's tons of opportunities out there. And, and the, I, the ideal thing is to focus the, the money that you have in your best ideas mm. and not in ideas that uh, maybe were you thought were a good idea and they're not so good anymore, but I'm going to hang on because I don't want to take a loss. Um, you know, I think that, that uh, you know, ego has no place <laughs> in mm. this business uh, yeah. and, it, and it can be very dangerous. Um, so I'm going to ask you the most difficult question of my whole podcast, which was not the question you just answered about your worst investment. Yeah. This one's difficult because I'm asking for one thing, not three. And so based upon what you learned from this and what you continue to learn, let's think about a young person out there who's, you know, getting into this situation. What's one action that you'd recommend our listeners take to avoid suffering the same fate? I think it's it's uh, learn to take losses. Um, learn to be proud of yourself for taking losses early. I mean, I think that is something that uh, the most successful investors and traders in the world all have in common: is they're not afraid of taking losses. They're not they're not uh, ashamed of taking losses. In fact, 
they pat themselves on the back for taking a, lo a loss early mm. when they recognize they've made a mistake. And so I think that's a skill we can cultivate um, uh, is, is, you know, you have your thesis, be very clear about what the thesis is. When things don't play out like you expected, move on, mm. you know, take, take your loss and move on. And I think that's, you know, if there's one skill, you know, Paul Tudor Jones talks about this, you know, focus on risk and let, you know, the gains take, gains will take care of themselves. Yeah. And so if you can focus on that risk management and discipline, um, you know, you'll be way ahead of, you know, most investors out there. Yeah. And it's probably true in life overall, when you're in a situation and a lot has been lost and it didn't go according to plan, don't be afraid to just say, Hey, I'm, I'm packing up. Yeah. Yep. That's, a, that's a great point because, you know, we, we talk about, uh, you know, the throwing good money after bad, right. Um, Paul Tudor Jones would call it, you know, call it, uh, you know, losers, average losers, but buying more of a, something that's not working, throwing good money after bad. That's such a great metaphor for life, right? When you're in a situation that's not working out as you would hope, you know, rather than dig the hole deeper, say, you know what, I'm going to move on and find something different. Mm. Um, yeah. Yep. It's just, uh, I think it's a helpful metaphor for life also. Uh, we we have the resources that you've got, like the FelderReport.com and Super Investors. Outside of those resources, is there any other resource that you'd recommend to our listeners? You know, I mentioned um, Twitter. I, you know, I'm, I'm uh, you know, I've been, you know, pretty high, maybe hyperactive on Twitter for a long time. Uh, I don't get in, I, I don't engage much, but I do share a lot of, uh, you know, I do a lot of reading um, every day and I, and I try and share on Twitter some of the most uh, interesting things that I find, whether it's articles, charts, mm. that kind of stuff. Um, and, and I found Twitter to be very valuable. I follow, you know, less than a hundred accounts, but every one of those accounts has, has taught something valuable and uh, so I, I, for me, uh, you know, th that platform uh, specifically has been one that uh, has had a lot of value. Yeah, it's incredible the amount of, you know, value that people are sharing and information and analysis. I mean, absolutely. So last question, what's your number one goal for the next 12 months? Number one goal for the next 12 months, you know, I, I, I have found, uh, you know, set goal setting to be kind of counterproductive. Productive. Um, you know, I, I think I, I like to ask on my podcast, I like to talk about sports and hobbies and things with people because I think they have good metaphors for, for what we do in the markets. And, uh, you know, I've been watching this new golf show on Netflix. Um, I think, is it Full Swing? Um, and Scotty Scheffler, best golfer in the world, number one ranked guy. And he just talks about, look, I'm, you know, when I'm in, I got the lead on Sunday and I'm going out to try and win a golf tournament. He goes, I'm not, you know, trying to shoot a certain number. I'm not trying to do anything specific. He goes, I'm just trying to play my best round of golf that I can and, and control what I can control and, you know, be okay with whatever the outcome is. So I think that's a good philosophy for, for a lot of different things. I'm just going to focus on the things that I love to do continue plugging away and, uh, you know, put my best efforts forward and, and whatever happens, happens. Mm, that's an interesting answer. And I think <laughs> is appealing in the sense that, uh, you know, in the end, when we do that, we get great outcomes. So it's a, a little bit of a counterintuitive thing, but I think it's a very interesting answer. Well, listeners, there you have it, another story of loss to keep you winning. Remember, I'm on a mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. If you've not yet joined that mission, just go to myworstinvestmentever.com and join my free weekly Become a Better Investor newsletter to reduce risk in your life. As we conclude, Jesse, I want to thank you again for joining our mission. And on behalf of A.E. Stotts Academy, I hereby award you alumni status for turning your worst investment ever into your best teaching moment. Do you have any parting words for the audience? No, I mean, this has been a lot of fun, Andrew. I really appreciate the opportunity. Um, you know, you, you made this very enjoyable. So <laughs> as enjoyable as it could be. So I appreciate it. Uh, I, we, we walk hand in hand through the pain. Well, you did a great job. We learned a lot. And that's a wrap on another great story to help us create, grow, and protect our well. Fellow risk takers, let's celebrate that today. We added one more person to our mission to help 1 million people reduce risk in their lives. This is your worst podcast host, Andrew Stott, saying, I'll see you on the upside.